All right, we are recording. What is up, party people? It is Dan, your basement guitar superstar. Today is another segment of Creator Spotlight, and I have the honor and privilege of speaking with John Snyder. He is the CEO and mastermind behind Electronic Audio Experiments, which is a really cool pedal company I just found out about not too long ago. But John, before we talk about your pedals, I want to talk about your music background. Cool. Um, so yeah, I, uh, you know, I got, actually got started as a classical violinist. Um, I, uh, you know, my, my parents kind of raised me and my siblings in a very musical household and they were like, okay, you've got to start playing an instrument. Um, and so I started taking violin lessons when I was, uh, six or seven years old. And, uh, you know, that, that was, that was really formative because it's such a, you know, it's such a different instrument. It's like a very technical one. You know, people spend like two years just learning how to hold it properly before you can even really right. make a note that doesn't sound like horrible screeching. Um, and, uh, you know, but as, and as much as I love that, I, I really wanted to learn how to play guitar because that's, you know, a lot more popular music is made, made with guitars. And um, when I was in high school, I got really into, uh, you know, to like alternative music and, and pop punk and stuff like that. And then just branched out all over the place. And so I picked up a guitar when I was probably about 13 years old. Um, and so then in parallel to that, I was always like very, uh, you know, engineering inclined. Um, so I was always tinkering, taking things apart. And so it wasn't too long before I started taking a soldering iron to my guitars and uh, my pedals and even my amps to some extent uh, with mixed results. But, you know, uh, I fell in love with the guitar because it is in many ways uh, the tinkerer's instrument. You know, it's uh it's an instrument where, you know, pretty much any part of it you can mess with in some way, whether it's, uh, you know, woodworking or the mechanical side of it or the electronics of it. And then, of course, the whole world of pedals and amps and speakers and uh, outboard gear and microphones, you know, it goes on forever. So oh, yeah. um, that just really scratched a niche for me. And so uh, that became my main instrument. Um, and, you know, I haven't, haven't looked back. So I've been playing, playing guitar for, for well over a decade now. Well, so what was your first guitar, and do you still own it? Ooh, let's see. So my first guitar was an Ibanez. Uh, I honestly am not sure if it was the Geo or the G10, but uh, it was a you know a, a, a crappy Super Strat that came with a practice amp, um, and uh, it was actually a birthday present for uh, my younger brother. Um, but I was the first one who played it because the way we told him we got this birthday present was. Uh, I brought the amp and guitar into his bedroom when he was still sleeping, turned it up all the way and played a chord. And so I think doing that actually like made me the owner of the guitar because he spent a summer <laughs> trying to play Beatles licks on it because he was super into the Beatles at the time. And then it just sat in his closet and I was like, well, I kind of want to play this. So, uh, you know, it ended up going from there. Um, thankfully, uh, you know, that, that guitar, despite being a piece of crap, uh, you know, I did learn quite a lot playing it. Honestly, I don't know where it is now. I don't, uh, it's probably in storage. It was probably in storage in my folks' place, but they've moved a few times in the last few years. So honestly, it could just be could be sitting in a basement somewhere. But uh, who knows? It was a real piece of junk, though. Well, hey, man, you got to learn on something, though, right? Exactly, exactly. And it made getting a a, a nicer guitar all that much more, uh, you know, of a revelation to say, oh my gosh, the action on this thing isn't half an inch high. You can actually okay. play it. <laughs> now, what's your main axe now, then? Ooh, so I've got a few that I'm kicking around. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, my favorite guitars are Travis Beans, um, the ones with aluminum necks. I actually have mine right back here. Let's see if I can do this without pulling my headphone jack out. Um, so this is my Travis Beans standard. Um, oh, nice. And, uh, you know, there's, there's that uh, T-shaped headstock. So this is actually a, a vintage one um, that I got for an absolute steal on eBay, um, well below half of what it's worth. And uh, the, it had been stripped of all the electronics and was in really bad shape. And uh, I actually sent it down to uh, Kevin at Electrical Guitar Company, who's kind of the authority on Travis Beans. Um, and so he was able to restore it. So I was able to get this vintage one for way less than what uh, the originals cost. And the pickups aren't original, but Kevin knows exactly how they're wound. So they might as well be the genuine article. And uh, that's, that's probably my main guitar. Um, but I also have a, I have a 90s Les Paul studio that I really love. I've got a GNLA app that I really love. Um, you know, just some nice, just some workhorse stuff. I try to, especially when designing pedals, use uh, more common instruments rather than the kind of oddball uh, metal neck stuff. Oh, yeah. um, 
so that I can be aware of what people are, you know, what a, a, a pedal might sound like in a more traditional effects chain and then, you know, expand on my weirder taste later on. So what, what style of music do you play then? Because usually guys I know that own metal neck guitars play like shoegaze or very ambient stuff that's super interesting and lots of modulation and all that. Where in that realm do you fall, do you think? So uh, I am currently in a band called uh, Verdigree, uh, which is like a post-metal outfit. Um, you know, we, uh, we started off wanting to sound kind of like, uh, like Sumac, um, Aaron Turner's band. Um, but what, what's kind of all over the place. Like there's, there's, I could name like a whole bunch of bands, but I guess the, the main thing is that it's heavy. It's, uh, sometimes it's slow. Sometimes it's fast. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of delay and reverb, you know, um, like lots of textural type stuff, um, interspersed with just like, you know, crushing heavy down tuned uh guitar riffs you know send me a link to some music i'll put it in the description for the video cool could totally do that and i definitely want to check it out too well thank you that's awesome um so obviously you've played music for a while at what point did you decide hey i really want to go into pedal building was there a certain thing that inspired you to do that or were you unhappy with your pedal like what you were finding in stores walk me through how that how that's I was, you know, so I, uh, I was building like pedal clones, uh, starting in like my senior year of high school. Um, I built a, a Zvex super hard on clone, um, on parts that I took out of the trash can at my, my high school job. Uh, I was, I was working as like a production floor assistant at this local electronics company, uh, in Connecticut where I grew up. And, uh, you know, they would just, they like, they would prototype stuff on like a breadboard and then just throw it in the trash. And I was like, all right, don't mind if I do. Um, <laughs> You know, they had like junk drawers of stuff and, um, you know, the, like that was, that place had been around for like 40 years. So there was so much trash there. Um, and so I was able to make these kind of junkyard creations. Most of them have not survived because I barely knew what I was doing. Um, but it was, there was, it was very satisfying to, to build a pedal, put it together and then, uh, you know, be able to play music with it, having, you know, with it having been something that I made. And so, uh, you know, when I was in college, I would build like Vero board clones for people on like perf board, uh, for beer money basically. Um, and, uh, you know, I actually had tried to start a pedal company with, uh, my buddy, Matt Manis, who now is, uh, the right hand guy at Adventure Audio, um, okay. up in Rochester. And okay. we went to, we went to college together for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, that we, neither of us knew what we were doing though. It is funny that we both now are, are, are uh, you know, working at pedal companies, but, uh, but you know, after a couple of false starts, I, I, um, you know, I realized that, that a lot of pedals were just copies of other pedals, um, which is not a bad thing, but it does mean that if you're trying to find something that is different, then, uh, it's very easy to kind of be spinning your wheels, you know, to say, okay, well, I'm going to try this new thing. And then you find out that it's based off of the same pedal as something else that you owned. Uh, it can be very easy to get stuck. And I was, I was in such a rut. Uh, that I wanted to come up with something new. Um, and so this, uh, you know, fast forward a few years to, to winter of, of 2015. Um, I uh, was in my first year of grad school and Boston got like 120 inches of snow in one winter. It was, it was insane. People I remember called it the snow apocalypse. It was almost <laughs> literally 120 inches of snow. I remember yeah. reading about that. Yeah. There was a there was a uh, pile of snow in a parking lot on my way to my uh, my old job. That was the pile of snow didn't go away until July of that year. It was it was nuts. Yeah. And so I lived in a basement apartment, um, and we would literally get buried in there. And so I was just like, all right, well, it's me, my breadboard, uh, you know, uh, a bunch of frozen food and a case of beer. Let's see what happens. And, uh, I, you know, basically during this time when like, it was, there was so much, so my, my exams were getting canceled. So I just had a lot of free time, didn't know what to do with it. And, uh, I designed the long sword, which was our first, uh, our first pedal. And that was kind of a result of me having the sound I was going for in my old band at the time, um, where I had this like pretty complicated pedal chain just to get one sound. And I was like, I could put this all in a true bypass looper and turn them all, you know, it was like a drive, a boost and an EQ, like all together. Right. And, uh, and then on top of that, the EQ settings that I liked for my clean tone on my amp were different than the EQ settings I liked for my dirty tone. So I wanted a drive that had like a really powerful EQ so that I didn't have to make that compromise. And so 
that was the long sword. It's got, you know, a lot of gain and a really intense EQ. It was perfect for what I was trying to do at the time. And uh, by that summer, I had, I had made the first batch of them with these like terrible hand painted enclosures that I had powder coated at a local bike shop. And, and um, you know, I learned a lot doing that, but uh, people bought them. They were interested in, in what I had. And if it weren't for those, you know, that like th th those first dozen people, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. Um, but that kind of gave me the motivation and a little bit of like startup money basically to, to design some other stuff. And so other pedals started to come in and, uh, you know, the business grew very slowly while I was still in school. Um, and then uh, I, I graduated, uh, I finished uh, my doctorate in, uh, in May. Um, and, uh, you know, the job market wasn't exactly good in May. So I said, well, you know what, all these folks are stuck at home. Uh, the pedal market's still doing okay. Let's make it go this full time. Let's see what happens when I can devote all my energy to it. And that's, that's uh, where I am today. And it's still going. Oh, so this is your, literally your full time gig right now. Yes. Um, okay. I don't know how long that's going to be the case, but, uh, you know, we've, we've been really fortunate and, uh, you know, it's pay, it's paying the bills and I'm stuck at home anyway. So might as well enjoy it, you know? Right, exactly. Well, and the thing, John, that attracted me specifically to your page on Instagram, I am a giant medieval nerd. Like, <laughs> medieval, I mm -hmm. like go gaga over. And I saw this pedal called the Halberd on there, and I'm like, oh my God, I have to <laughs> hear what this sounds like. It, I mean, just that name implies to me that it's super interesting. And that's kind of how I found out about you. Now, are you a big medieval nerd too? Is that kind of how that you did the name Longsword in the first place? So I would say for me, it's mostly coming from like a D and D perspective. Um, nice. I've been playing playing D and D really seriously uh, for for like five years now. Um, okay. And you know, probably it's good, it's good, good. Then I'm a dwarf barbarian. In the oh man, I'm so I'm currently playing a playing a half orc fighter um, nice. with a sailor background in a in a five e seafaring campaign. I could go on about it. It would derail this interview. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe but, we'll uh, talk about that some other time. Or something. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, when I was designing the Halberd, my, my character actually, uh, was, I'd sort of had a, uh, I'd been, I was, I wanted him to get a Halberd. He ended up getting a hammer instead, but that was sort of the genesis for it. Cause I was like, I had this kind of loose idea that most of my drive pedals have like a sort of D and D or fantasy weapon name. Um, it's kind of, I've stuck to it loosely, not completely, but, uh, I always got a kick out of that, you know, yeah. just as, uh. It, the the original genesis of it was literally just okay. The longsword cuts through the mix, you know. Something so goofy as that ended up becoming like a uh, you know kind of a theme, like a loose theme that I I've, I've just been running with. Right. If you don't mind me asking, how many longswords have you made and sold total? Let's see. I think we're somewhere around uh, three or four hundred at this point. Wow. Um, awesome. Okay. Thank so you. you guys are doing really good then. Yeah, it's uh, it's been over the last last few years, and you know, production has just kind of slowly done this. It's actually been off the market for about a year because um, I didn't have time to make them in my last like six months of school. Um, and uh, now I'm at the point where you know I basically spent this whole summer redesigning everything to be more manufacturable, and uh, that just wrapped up. So we're getting them back into production literally as we speak. I actually got. Uh, the circuit boards in uh, a week ago. And so nice. the rest of the parts are coming in and that'll be back on the market. And I'm, I'm excited I, to get that back I'm out there. I'm planning on picking up a long sword and a halberd at some point for the channel. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think so you really take it. It be March, April time frame because I have enough stuff that I'm reviewing between then. But awesome. Well, we'll be here when you're ready. It's on my board. So, but hey, um, tell me about the Duncan Daggers. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh so me and uh my graphics guy uh zach who also does a lot of the a lot of um helps me a lot with the assembly and production and stuff um we love we love spoof logos but we're all we also uh you know have both lived in new england our whole lives and you know how people can be with their local fast food chain where it's like a, you know you kind of it's like an ironic enjoyment but then it's like oh you are actually addicted to this stuff yeah, exactly. um, and so we were like you know this is gonna be a perfect day for fool's joke um, the problem is that running an April fool's joke during the middle of a pandemic makes everything super slow, but we got, we, so we had this pre order that, that, that went way beyond the deadline, but, uh, we did get them out there and it was fun to just do something that was just totally goofy. Um, you know, we've got like a, a, a dagger, you know, like kind of standard edition in our lineup. Um, but we thought it'd be funny to just do that, that logo spoof and, uh, you know, just put four creams in everybody's coffee, you know? 
<laughs> nice. Are you going to do any more of those? Um, I don't know what we're going to do. I, uh, I do. I, I am sitting on a few more of the Duncan daggers. I'll probably, probably blow out at the end of the year. Um, when, uh, when the postal service catches up on everyone's Christmas presents. Um, oh, yeah. but that was kind of, oh, just a fun, uh, a fun, uh, you know, April fool's type joke, but oh, sure. we'll sure. keep doing the shirts though. Cause the shirts are fun. Yeah. Talk to me about kind of what your 5, 10, 15 year plan is. I mean, obviously you guys are making a ton of headway. You have a buttload of followers on Instagram. What do you, what do you give credit for that? Other so, than just building really kick, kick butt pedals. Well, thank you. You know, I, I it's funny, like, I think, uh, you know, I, I have to confess, I don't really understand um, the sort of like rigors of social media. Like there are people out there who, who know what their analytics mean. They know how to track all this stuff. They know, you know, I, I've always kind of taken the build it and they will come approach. Um, and I think that uh, part of that is it, it's almost funny. Like I when I developed the long sword, I thought I had this like really specific problem that no one else had. And so I had to make it myself in order to, to get what I wanted. But it turns out that uh, my problems weren't so unique after all. Uh, it turns out that the thing I was trying to solve was uh, something that another person, a, a problem that someone else had. They didn't, maybe they didn't know they had it uh, oh, uh, immediately. And so, uh, you know, basically what I'm trying to do is, is just find ways to do things that are uh, different and creative enough, but could still be used in a classic and familiar sense. Uh, so that that way I can bring in folks to maybe try something a little bit different, um, but it, they still could have us. There could still be a setting that that plays nice with the things that they're familiar with. Well, um, it sounds like you use transistors in your pedals instead of kind of the normal normal stuff that's in there. It, so, tell me about kind of what how that developed. Were you not? I'm assuming you weren't getting the sound out of stuff that's normally inside pedals, and the transistors kind of gave you more versatility. Or something. So I think it's kind of like, uh, you know, it, it's, it's all about the tools, right? And when, you know, it, uh, the, the best analogy I can think of uh, is, you know, you, a lot of guitar, all guitars have something special to offer, right? right. But when you pick up a Telecaster, you might play different riffs than what you're going to play on a Les Paul. Um, like that's kind of that, like that, that's something that I, I, you know, I'll, I'll pick up different guitars for different kinds of inspiration. They just lend themselves to certain type of types of things. Right. And in the same way to me as an electronics designer, um, transistors and then, uh, you know, ICs like op amps, uh, are a similar thing. Like I, when I am, uh, trying out a new circuit and I'm using, uh, op amps, operational amplifier, basically it's like a, it's a, a, it's a type of amplifier that you can, uh, program its gain and, and say right. how much gain it has. Um, whereas a transistor is like a little bit more down to the raw physics of it at the end of the day, you have to do a little more to massage it into something that's going to make a meaningful amplifier. Um, and, uh, and an op amp is just made out of, uh, you know, dozens of transistors all kind of working in harmony to get, uh, the thing that you want. And it's like all of that legwork goes to make something that's more predictable. Um, okay. and so when I was, uh, you know, the, the, the long sword is op amp based and it's got, you know, that, that's what gives it like the really precise EQ filters and like lots of uh, range on that and all this versatility. And the halberds all discrete transistors, which makes it a little like rougher around the edges. You know, it's like less refined. Um, and, uh, you know, but it just has this like, you know, it just has a very unique character to it because, uh, you know, you've got individual transistors all kind of contributing in a way that I've specifically chosen rather than leaving it up to the engineers who like designed a whole integrated circuit, you know. Right. Um, but that's the difference. Like it's, that, it does seem like the halberd. I noticed that that's markedly different than obviously the long sword. They're two different circuits anyway, but I really love the halberd because it's got like this nice trebly mid rangey fuzz to it mm -hmm. that I haven't really heard before. It's a, it's definitely a unique sound. I was really inspired by uh, some like older like recording preamps, you know, like there are a lot of pedals that are inspired by like the Neve type sound. Oh, sure. Um, you know, like that's, that's like, they're, they're not really the same under the hood, but like that was like, a, that was a sound that inspired me. I was also really inspired by um, like the color sound over driver and the Univox Unidrive, both of which okay. use uh, transistors and, and, uh, but a lot of them are, are very like, they're even, even more unrefined, you know, like they, they're like kind of fart out if you hit them too hard um, or like they're super fizzy sounding. And then that's like part of the sound, like in a band mix, you know, it's, it's really mean and they're super dynamic. Uh, but I wanted to take those characteristics and then kind of 
uh, you know, like refine it just like one level more than what where they were, but not all the way to like an IC based distortion pedal. Yeah. If that makes sense. Um, yeah. It was like taking that magic and just like putting a little bit of constraints on it in order to to just make it easier to dial in and like you know uh, work right. If you have like a buffer or active pickups in front, you know, like it works into different more like a greater variety of amps, like all that all that kind of stuff. Uh, okay. Just like keep putting that lightning in a bottle, you know. What about the what about the hyper sleep? Because I think I think the halberd and the longsword. I can't decide which one of those two is my favorite of your circuits based on the videos I've seen. But the most interesting circuit, and to me anyway, is the hyper sleep. So kind of tell me how how you came up with that because that's got some really cool sounds with it. Thank you. Um, so that was uh, the story behind that one is is interesting. I've got uh, a buddy of mine, um, Dan Danger. Um, he's a tiny media empire on Instagram. He's an, a phenomenal illustrator, um, and he's he's based out in Western Mass. And in his art studio, he has an absolutely legendary collection of pedals. Um, he has pretty much, I think, every single electro harmonics pedal uh, built before 1990. Um, you know, like this, it is like a museum in there. And we're talking uh, Josh Scott level. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, like people like the, the, like there's something special about a hardcore pedal collector because they see stuff that isn't even on the internet, you know? Um, and, and I could get lost for hours in there. It's really, it's really something. But one of the crown jewels of his collection was this pedal called the, the solid state revert by electro harmonics. And it is, uh, it uses this, this, uh, this chip, a, a bucket brigade chip, kind of like what you find in an analog delay, except instead of just one echo coming out of it, uh, six echoes come out of it. Um, and if you mix those echoes in different ratios and different amounts or feed them back into the input, then it's kind of like room reflections. Like I'm in this room and I've got reflections off the computer monitor and uh, you know, off my table lamp and off the wall and all those reflections are coming back at different times. And that's what gives the sense of being in a room. Um, so that that's what this this bucket brigade chip was trying to do. The problem is that it came out like right when digital reverb became a thing, and everyone was like, "Oh, well, digital reverb is way more flexible. It's lower noise. You could do more with it. Let's all move over to that stuff." And then you had like the yeah. '80s rack effect revolution. Um, but those chips uh, still have this magic to them. And when I played this uh, this EHX uh, pedal, which never even went to market. That's how rare this thing is. They're like, they're like, I think a dozen of them ever made. Um, and I was just blown away by how it sounded, even though it was noisy and the controls were weird. And it literally had like a mislabeled knob on it because it was a prototype. Um, and uh, so I actually had the opportunity to, to reverse engineer it um, and learn a thing or two about the circuit. But I also, uh, you know, was able to, to sort of see its shortcomings firsthand. And so I, I was like, I'm in love with this chip. I need to design an effect around it that, um, you know, gets some of the things I like about the, about the EHX, but is its own sound. And so that's where the hypersleep came from. And I actually tried like two or three different times to, to build, design that effect and I just couldn't get it right. Um, and it wasn't until like last year where I really felt like my engineering chops were at the point where I could actually make it work with it being like low enough noise and uh, have enough like range on the controls. And uh, yeah, so I, you know, I just, these, these chips are not made anymore. They're in limited supply. And so uh, I wanted, I wanted to, to do right by it. You know, I wanted to make something that was uh, like actually, actually like worth using these chips that are in finite supply. And so, so yeah, that was, uh, that was it. I'm going to keep making them as long as I can find those chips, but uh, it's definitely a fun effect. It doesn't sound like any other kind of reverb. And um, you know, I just, I think it's pretty special. So what's in store for 2021 then? Do you have Ooh, all right. that are kind of on the table that you haven't released yet? Yeah, so I can actually, I, I brought props with me. Um, so the first, the first thing is, uh, one of the first things is, is this. Um, so this is a collaboration with uh, Obstructures. Um, they, make, they make aluminum guitars, uh, among other things. Um, and we've been collaborating on this, on this pedal design since 2017. Um, those guys, they actually came up to visit me in Boston like 2018, and we were still, we've still been working on it. Um, and, uh, you know, they basically wanted to make an indestructible pedal. So this is like a, a custom made die cast enclosure. It weighs like twice as much as a normal pedal. Um, nice. and, and, uh, you know, the first, the first effect, uh, we, we want this to be a new series. This is like the first time I'm really talking about this. I've kind of hinted at it on Instagram. Um, 
but this is going to be a new series. This is a, this is a boost um, and, and overdrive. Eventually, we're going to expand in some other types of effects, but we just want to test the waters with this one. Oh, and, sure. uh, you know, it's, it's easily the most over-engineered thing I've ever made in my life. Um, you could hit someone over the head with this, you know, pretty hard. Um, but it's also just like you could also run it over with a car if you wanted. Um, so what are those four settings on there if, you're, if you want to talk about it? If not, you don't have to. Oh, yeah. So basically, uh, it's a little hard to read uh, on my webcam, but you basically have a slider for volume, uh, filter, which is a treble control, uh, gain, which is you know just a gain control, and then focus, which is actually like a treble booster type circuit up front. Um, so it already gets pretty dirty, but then you can push this like really harsh, like upper mid-range like clang into it. Uh, to get this like really like aggressive tight tone, so um, you know, and it, it it's it, it's pretty nasty sounding. But uh, you're, you're speaking my language right now, <laughs> John, because I love my very mid rangey type stuff. Well, in that case, yeah, you'll you'll be all over this. Um, if you've ever listened, so there's uh, the Obstructors guys were in this band called New Brutalism, um, which is a little bit like shellac type noise rock, but not quite as like weird. <laughs> Um, like they just, they just like, they just, it's riffs. It's really good. Um, and this a, does sound a, a lot link via email or something. Yeah, totally can. This, this kind of sounds like that band in a box. Um, you yes. know, I just wanted to make something that was like very on brand for these guys. And, uh, you know, but also like within their, their kind of MO of just indestructible devices and, and things like their guitars are also just you know, basically indestructible. Like you could light their guitars on fire and nothing would happen. So nice. they're just, uh, it's awesome. So that's, that's one thing. And then the other thing I actually posted about this today, but this is a prototype uh, of my analog delay sending um, that I've pretty extensively modified for some new features. Um, V2 is slowly but surely in the works. Uh, I don't want to release any other pedals until this is ready to go. Um, other than what's already in the pipeline anyway. Uh, but that's going to be my next like actual new product. And so it's a, it's an analog delay with tap tempo. Um, and so now I'm, I'm kind of, I'm trying to basically expand the functionality a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, add some things like presets and, uh, you know, like, a, a like modulation and that, that sort of thing. Um, basically take what's there and just, uh, add a, a degree of control that is a little bit more professional and more versatile. So what, what ideas do you have in your head that you haven't put on paper yet? Like, are you, do you think you'll ever branch off into doing some really exotic stuff like Earthquaker does like the, something like the rainbow machine or that anime pedal, if you know what I'm yeah. talking about or any of <laughs> um, that type of thing? I've got a few ideas. So my goal for going into the new year is to learn, uh, is to get better at programming. Um, I have to confess I'm a, I'm an okay at best programmer. Um, and so I'm trying to really, uh, you know, build up my chops there so that I can get into DSP and do some weirder stuff. Um, I would love to release a digital reverb someday. I've got a few ideas for how to make that special, I think. Um, you know, especially, you know, there's, there's a lot of incredible reverbs on the market. Um, you know, even just this year, we had the Red Panda Context 2, um, which is like, uh, a great meat and potatoes reverb. The spring, the spring sound on it is unbelievable, but it can also do these huge expansive textures. You've got the Death by Audio Rooms, um, which I actually helped on, um, and uh, that can do some really like big digital sounds, but also some weird like modulated stuff. Um, and then there's the Chase Bliss uh, and Maris reverb, which is like you know uh, that's like 1970s rack gear basically, but it's got like a really iconic and expansive sound and all this control that you can take advantage of. So carving out my own niche in that is going to be hard. Like the bar is really high. So I'm taking it slow. Um, I'm trying to make sure that my ideas are actually good before I, I go out there with them. And, uh, you know, I've got like some, I've got some stuff programmed in, uh, in pure data, um, which is this program where you can basically make like a block diagram uh, of like effects processing. Um, and it's all like really granular. So you can be like, okay, here's a filter. Here's like a delay. Uh, but then, you know, if you want to make a reverb, you have to take a bunch of delays and put them all together, you know, to make oh, a cool. reverb. Um, so I've got some stuff like that that's rigged up, but the, the jump from that into like a physical pedal is, is pretty huge. And so I'm, I'm just taking baby steps for that, but I definitely want to do a reverb next year. Uh, like an actual, like good digital reverb with lots of sounds in it. So well, that's like a big goal of mine. That for sure. Thank um, you. 
As far as, uh, obviously, there's a ton of boutique builders out there right now. What, what would you say is the biggest thing that sets you apart from the rest of them? So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a good question because, you know, like there are so many companies, companies that have, have a lot of special stuff to offer. Um, and, uh, you know, like I, I, don't, I don't believe in zero-sum games. Like there really is like, you know, this is such like a thriving market. And I think a big part of that is like the, the competitive or the collaborativeness of everyone. Like people are competitive with themselves, not necessarily with one another. It's like everyone sort of stays in their lane, which I, I think is cool. Um, you know, my, my lane, I would say, is very like over-engineered uh, and, and unique analog stuff in particular. Um, and where that's mostly been, been showing up is in drive pedals. Like there are, there are people who can run circles around me in the synth world with analog stuff. And so I'm, I'm educating myself in that regard. But, uh, you know, if, if, if someone wants to design, you know, a really good analog front end or a mixer or, you know, make their, you know, give their drive pedal unique quality, uh, you know, that's something, that's something that I've, I've been able to help a lot of folks with. Um, and also that's what makes my own work stand out is just having these, you know, just really careful engineering and, uh, you know, it's mostly been in dirt pedals so far, but that's why I want to expand uh, my lineup because, you know, like pedals like, uh, you know, Sending, which, you know, the first, the first ones came out in 2018 um, or Hypersleep, you know, like I, I've been diving into, uh, you know, analog delays and reverbs and, uh, you know, I, I hope that I have a lot more to offer in that regard too. So, but yeah, I'm very much an analog guy and I want to, want to expand that. Dude, I'm I'm the same way, man. I prefer analog over digital. I just feel like it sounds more pure. If if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. But it's um, yeah, it's funny. It's funny when you some, sometimes I I find myself very surprised every once in a while because uh, you know I it's all you know DSP is so good now where it's basically just in the quality of the code. But there's always going to be something that uh, you know that that designers are you know are not going to find when they're modeling something. But every once in a while. I've, I've been fooled. So it's, you know, my, my days as an analog guy might be numbered. I don't know. <laughs> right. Could be, you never know. Um, are you doing when Nam gets back and going again, are you planning on doing that at all? I hope so. I really hope so. Um, you know, there's a, one of the things I was kind of looking forward to when I started doing, you know, when I at least like floated the idea of doing this full time, my original plan was after I got my degree, I'd spend a few months uh, kind of getting all my stuff, in a place where it could be many manu contract manufactured. So that way, if I had to go get a real job, um, you know, this is a real job. Like I had to go, if I had to go work for another company, um, you know, I would be able to carry on the brand in some capacity. Um, and, uh, you know, and instead, instead the job market sucked as I've been doing this and I'm really happy doing it, but I, I definitely miss the social aspect. Like my wife and I were going to do a, a road trip to summer Nam. We were going to drive down to Nashville I've got family in East Tennessee. I've got friends and family, uh, you know, in North and South Carolina. We were going to drive all around. And obviously that didn't happen, uh, right. which is a real bummer. Um, and so I, I really look forward to being able to go back, uh, you know, because at this point, like NAM, NAM is just is mostly a social affair. I'm not really trying to get dealers because we can't make enough pedals um, right now, maybe someday. But, uh, right. you know, there are lots of folks who live all over the country and, and that's like my time to see them, you know, and uh, to actually – interact with people is, is kind of nice. So, uh, I am, I definitely am looking forward to going back. Yeah. I'd like to go. I, I've never been before. I mean, obviously I just started doing the YouTube thing not too long ago. So hopefully I'll be able to go at some point. Um, had an interesting question based on something I saw on Brad's profile on your website. Oh yeah. It's, and I know this is probably a joke. Um, <laughs> it says he is the keeper of the secret room. Now, are you allowed into that secret room? I'm not allowed into the secret room. There is a uh, there is a folder on our our server that says Brad's secret room, no one allowed. Um, and who knows what he keeps in there? Probably lots of bootleg horror movies, if I were to guess. <laughs> oh yeah, nice, that's hilarious. <laughs> or maybe the plans, uh, you know, for the the Roswell the Roswell spaceship. We don't we don't really know. Oh yeah, nice. <laughs> that's the in the in the photo on on our website. Uh, it's actually, it's a map of Roswell, New Mexico with all of the, uh, you know, like crash sites and everything oh, mapped really? out. Yeah. Nice, dude. Like He's he's, into the, he's way into that stuff. Oh, I am too. He and I get along great. Yeah. Brad is, Brad is great. I can't, I can, I, I have nothing but good things to say about Brad. He's just like, he's, he's awesome. Nice. So is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you want people to know about? 
Let's see. I mean, I think I, uh, you know, I managed to talk about some of the new stuff we've got coming in. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's really it. Like I've just been, I've been in the R and D trenches basically all, all summer and fall. And uh, you know, it, I, I, I guess the one thing I, I really want to say is how thankful I am for all the folks who've been buying our, our pedals when they come out. And uh, you know, it really means a lot to have this support because it means that I can, uh, you know, tinker and experiment freely, um, you know, in the hopes of finding out, making something else that people will be into, you know, sure. um, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a good time to be in this community, I think, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Awesome. So when, when are you going to have more pedals available? Cause I noticed you're sold out of everything on the website. Yeah. Yeah, we actually, we, so we just continued, discontinued the Mew Blaster, which was a clean boost we released a few years ago, and it, it never sold super well, um, but it, it's got kind of a cult following, so we're going to open source it for the people who can, uh, who want to build their own. Um, and, uh, but yeah, the, uh, we're, we were hoping to get the long start out by the end of the year. Unfortunately, um, you know, with, with COVID, everything's operating at kind of half speed right now, right. and so... You know, I care way more about the, you know, the health and safety of, of our suppliers and, and, and mail carriers and everything than I do oh, about absolutely. getting stuff on time. So, we're, yep. I, so I'm actually kind of enjoying the break right now. Um, but we are going to, as soon as long starting closures come in, we're going to have those back on the market. Um, we've got the surveyor coming back pretty soon. Um, and uh, and then probably more halberds in the spring. We've got the obstructors pedal coming. So it's it's a little quiet right now, but things are going to be ramping right back up. Awesome. Good to hear. Well, hopefully this uh, this pandemic gets over sooner rather than later, and uh, you know we can meet up at like Nam or something, and absolutely, meet over absolutely. Here or something like that. But anyway, thank you, John, and um, for those of you watching, thank you so much for joining me. I will post a link to Electronic Audio Experiments website and their Instagram in the description. If you see something you like on there, John will have more pedals out. It sounds like first part of next year. Make sure you check them out on YouTube videos. I'll post a couple of each of their pedals. And uh, if you like something you see, pick, pick something up, support John, what he's doing. He seems like a really good dude. So thanks, John. Appreciate Thank you very much, Dan. Glad to have, glad to have you on here. <laughs> All right. Likewise. See ya.